Hello there. Hope you're looking forward to your masterclass in literary analysis with, with Oxford University. My name is Dr Jessica Stacey and I'm going to talk to you about narrative perspective. Narrative perspective, sometimes also called point of view, it encompasses things like where the narration is first, second or third person and also the way that the narrative is focalised or might be focalised through particular characters. Two important questions that we need to ask in order to understand narrative perspective in a work and how narrative perspective might change over a work are qui parle and qui voit. And I'm going to take an example from a first person narrative to start and from one of the A-level syllabus texts, so Camus L'étranger. Well, let's have a look at the famous opening. Aujourd'hui, maman est morte, ou peut-être hier, je ne sais pas. So as I said, it's a first person narrative. We're told that Maman has died, so in the passé composé, but the narrative is in the present tense, so the narrator tells us je ne sais pas. And qui parle and qui voit are very close here, you know, we seem to be getting Marceau's perspective narrated to us simultaneous with his perception. Uh, the narrator doesn't know anything that kind of the Marceau of the present doesn't know, and so we consequently don't know anything that he doesn't know. However, this changes over the course of the first part of the novel. And I'm going to skip over everything that happens in the middle to go right to the end of that first part, uh, to what happens just after Marceau shoots the Arab on the beach. So he says, J'ai compris que j'avais détruit l'équilibre du jour, le silence exceptionnel d'une plage où j'avais été heureux. Alors j'ai tiré encore quatre fois sur un corps énorme où les balles s'enfonçaient sans qu'il y parût. Et c'était comme quatre coups brefs que je frappais sur la porte du malheur. So if we ask again qui parle and qui voit, évidemment it's, it's Marceau each time because it's first person narrative. But qui voit, who is the narrative being focalised through, this is Marceau on the beach. Um, so we're hearing you know, what he understood, which is that he had destroyed the equilibrium of the day, that he had ruined something through this action. Uh, and how that leads to his following action, which is to shoot four more times. Uh, but then, qui parle, the narrator, the narrating Marceau, has some knowledge that the Marceau who's being narrated doesn't have. C'était comme quatre coups brefs que j'ai frappé sur la porte du malheur. So it was like four knocks on the door of misfortune or misery or unhappiness. Um, that suggests that the Marceau who is narrating knows how big an effect these kind of four unnecessary shots are going to have on his fate, uh, the role that they're going to play in the eventual giving of the death sentence. And we can think about this by thinking about the two times of narration. So narrated time, which for us kind of coincides here with the qui voit. Um, so the narrated time would be sort of Marceau's story from the death of his mother, right the way through to him waiting for his execution the morning in his cell. And the narrating time, on the other hand, can be conceived of variously as the time it takes for us to read the story, the time it takes for the story to be told, and also for the position of the narrator relative to the story, so the qui parle. And as I said before, we see here that this must be a morceau who has knowledge of what is going to happen. So, you know, perhaps him in his cell the night before his execution. So for contrast, let's have a look at this citation from Emile Zola's L'Oeuvre, which in English is the masterpiece. Arrivé devant sa porte, une vieille porte ronde et basse, bardée de fer, Claude, aveuglé par la pluie, tâtonna pour tirer le bouton de la sonnette, et sa surprise fut extrême, il en eut un tressaillement en rencontrant dans l'encogneur collé contre le bois, encore vivant. Puis, à la brusque lueur d'une seconde éclair, il aperçut une grande jeune fille, vêtue de noir et déjà trompée, qui crelottait de peur. So, if we think about who's speaking, qui parle, we can see that this is a third-person narrator, we're being told about Claude's actions. But if we ask qui voit, whose perspective are we seeing from, I think you can see pretty clearly that we are, the scene is being focalised through Claude. So we have, you know, the feeling of being within this great storm, aveugle par la pluie, and 
the narration of the events and what Claude perceives are really given to us through Claude's senses. So he tatona um, to try and find the doorbell. And then we're imagining that, you know, there are multiple flashes of lightning. In the first flash of lightning, we learn simply that there is a living body uh, that he's come up against in the doorway. And then not until we get the second flash of light, so Claude is able to see again, do we learn that this is une grande jeune fille. Now we can also use the idea of narrative perspective to illuminate the interaction between first and second degree narratives. So a first degree narrative is the narration as it is addressed directly to the reader. And a second degree narrative is a narrative or story set into that narration. So you might know this as a story within a story or a framed narrative. So I'm giving you an example here from an 18th century novel, uh, Prévost's Manon Lusco, and I'll just read through the citation. Je lui demandais d'où il venait. Il me répondit qu'il arrivait par mer du Havre de Grasse, où il était revenu de l'Amérique peu auparavant. Vous ne me paraissez pas fort bien en argent, lui dis-je. « Allez-vous-en au lion d'or où je suis logé. Je vous rejoindrai dans un moment. » J'y retourne en effet, plein d'impatience d'apprendre les détails de son infortune et les circonstances de son voyage d'Amérique. Je lui fis mille caresses et j'ordonnai qu'on ne laissa manquer de rien. Il n'attendit point que je le pressasse de me raconter l'histoire de sa vie. Voici donc son récit, auquel je ne mêlerai jusqu'à la fin rien qui ne soit de lui. J'avais dix-sept ans, et j'achevais mes études de philosophie à Amiens, où mes parents, qui sont d'une des meilleures maisons de paix, m'avaient envoyé. So here I've highlighted in red the statements by the unnamed narrator of the first degree narrative. So we see, lui dis-je, son récit, je ne mêlerai jusqu'à la fin rien qui ne soit de lui. This is all context for the narrative, the second degree narrative, which is going to take up the bulk of the novel. And here we have highlighted in green the shift to the second degree narrative. So henceforth, the je in this story is going to be the chevalier, rather than the unnamed narrator who opened the novel. So I wanted to give you this example because it helps us to think about what's motivating the narration of a text. We always want to be asking this question uh, when analysing a text. What is motivating the narrative? Does the narrator have any kind of agenda? And when we have a first and second degree narrative like this, so a framing and a framed narrative, it's particularly clear that there is a motivation because the telling of the story arises from an interaction between two people within the first degree narrative. So if we think again about the two times of narration, qui parle? It's the Chevalier des Grieux uh, in the time of narration. And the time of narration is very much the time in which the Chevalier des Grieux is sitting in the tavern with the unnamed narrator of the first degree narrative telling his story. And then Qui voit, who is the, the story being focalised through, this is the Chevalier in the narrated time. So that's the time of his love for Manon. So, to look at another quotation, Le supérieur, ayant ordonné à ses religieux de le conduire, demeura seul avec moi. Je lui fis un récit abrégé de la longue et insurmontable passion que j'avais pour Manon, de la situation florissante de notre fortune avant que nous eussions été dépouillés par nos propres domestiques, des offres que G.M. avait faites à ma maîtresse, de la conclusion de leur marché et la manière dont il avait été rompu. Je lui représentais des choses à la vérité, the côté le plus favorable pour nous. And I particularly wanted to choose this moment because I think it's a particularly interesting uh, example of the Chevalier telling us about when he told his story a previous time, right? So he's telling his story to the unnamed narrator of the novel, but he's also telling us about when he told uh, the superior of an abbey uh, the history of himself and Manon. And he gives us lots of clues that he might not be the most reliable narrator here. So he says, I you know, represented things to him uh, to tell you the truth under the most favourable light. And this should make us ask, well, you know, can we completely trust the story that the Chevalier is telling to the unnamed narrator and thus that we're hearing from that unnamed narrator? You know, could he also be representing things under the most favourable light? 
And if you go back to the citation on the previous slide, you'll see that in particular, you know, we see that he's not got a lot of money. You know, at the very least, he's earning his dinner. So fundamentally, the Chevalier is telling a story in each instance because he wants some kind of help. Uh, so to the unnamed narrator, financial help. And in this scene that I have on this slide, when he's talking to the superior, he wants the superior to help him get out of prison. And another way that we can think about the two times of narration in order to ask well, what kind of interpretation, what kind of layer might be sort of intervening between our understanding of the facts narrated and, and the story narrated is by thinking about the adult versus the child jeu. So this is another first person example. Uh, and this is Annie Arnaud's Mémoire de Fille, which is a semi-autobiographical novel uh, written a few years ago. And if we ask qui parle and qui voit, we see that there's an ironizing adult gaze brought to bear on the world of the protagonist. So although the narrator and the protagonist are the same, the same person, the adult and the child jeu, there is a difference between them and a difference in the way that they see the world. So, to read the quote, Nous passons ensemble tout notre temps libre, en l'absence de nos bonnes femmes, ainsi désignent sont les mères de famille qui nous emploient. On se rue sur le téléphone dont l'usage privé à domicile était une grande découverte l'une pour l'une et l'autre. Je nous vois la grande et la petite, couple mal assorti, double patte et patachon. So, as I said, it's a first-person narrative. It's narrated in the present tense, which gives a real sense of immediacy. Uh, the part in red seems to be entirely focalised through the young woman. Uh, she's just telling us what happens, you know, the excitement of discovering that you can use a telephone at home. But in the green part, so I see us, the, the kind of big and the small, a odd couple, double pâté patachon. And double pâté patachon, um, well, a, kind of a comedy duo, and they're one of the, mo the models for Laurel and Hardy. So the reason that I have highlighted this in green and called it an ironizing gaze with an adult narrator is that she's kind of, by making this reference to a sort of Laurel and Hardy style couple, there's an element of, of laughing at her younger self. You know, she is suggesting a certain kind of naivety that maybe they looked a little bit ridiculous and they didn't realize how ridiculous they looked. So despite the fact that the previous um, the previous parts are narrated in this first person, present tense. We're not getting kind of just the point of view of the younger woman. We are definitely getting like interpretation by the adult self. And indeed, Memoir de Fille plays a lot with this idea. And sometimes Arnaud uses elle to talk about the younger self. And sometimes she uses je, so kind of playing with showing that distance. And so just to finish up, I wanted to give you an example from a novel in English that many of you may have read or at least seen the TV adaptation of, and that's Sally Rooney's Normal People. And I wanted to use this novel because what it does really well is use multiple perspectives in third person narrative to cast doubt on events. And as I've written at the bottom here, the third person narrator delays the reader's full understanding of an event by focalising it twice, each time through a different limited third person perspective. And so the event that we're being told about from a couple of different angles, that's Marianne's point of view and Connell's point of view, um, is a breakup. And so first we're going to have Marianne later in the narrative thinking back to a breakup that happened in May. So Marianne hasn't seen Connell since May. He moved home after the exams and she stayed in Dublin. He said he wanted to see other people and she said, OK. Now, because she was never really his girlfriend, she's not even his ex-girlfriend. She's nothing. So now the first three sentences, we get a pretty, you know, seemingly very straightforward assertion of events uh, from the third person perspective. So Marion hasn't seen Connell since May. He moved home after the exams. He said he wanted to see other people. You know, we don't have any reason so far to doubt these assertions. We do get a little hint that we're in fact much more kind of inside Marianne's mind uh, than the first few sentences might suggest by the penultimate and last sentence. So because she was never really his girlfriend, she's not even his ex-girlfriend, she's nothing. These much more than the kind of 
assertion of somebody outside Marianne seem to be things that Marianne is thinking. And then several pages later, 14 pages later in the novel, we actually end up going back to May and getting the scene of this breakup focalised through Connell. So Connell couldn't understand how this had happened, how he had let the discussion slip away like this. It was too late to say that he wanted to stay with her, but when had it become too late? It seemed to have happened almost immediately. He contemplated putting his face down on the table and just crying like a child. There was a long pause. I don't know, he said. I guess you'll want to see other people then, will you? Finally, in a voice that struck him as truly cold, Marianne said, sure. So, through focalising the scene through Connell, the narrator tells us that, in fact, Marianne's understanding of what happened is impartial or even wrong. Um... I mean, neither of them, neither of them has a full understanding of what happened, right? Because both thinks that the other is cold, both thinks that the other wants to break up and wants to see other people. Um, but what Sally Rooney is kind of trying to tell us through all of this is how easy it is to have a terrible misunderstanding within passionate relationships and the difficulty of you know, truly understanding another person's point of view and the way that our kind of fears uh, can can really undermine us. So, you know, particularly with Connell, we have the sense of like having lost control of the situation and sort of giving up on this suggestion of seeing other people and his assumption of Marianne's coldness in response. Whereas Marianne, as we already know, felt that she was being broken up with in this scene. So to sum up, uh, to analyse narrative perspective, you need to ask two questions at the start. Qui parle? So who narrates? And qui voit? Who is the scene focalised through, if anyone? And for third person narration, the distinction may be maybe pretty clear. Um, I have a third person narrator, but you might be seeing the scene through the eyes of a particular character. But that being said, in first person narrative, we should not assume that qui parle and qui voit are identical even if they are the same individual. And one of the ways we can understand that is to think about the two times of narration. So the narrated time, the time of the story, and the narrating time, the time at and in which the story is told. And in both of these instances, so in the third person narrative or the first person narrative, the distinction between qui parle and qui voit invites us to look for some kind of interpretation of the story narrated being introduced through the role of the narrator and through the distinction between the narrator and the figure through whom the scene is focalised. And we also need to remember that we won't necessarily have one narrative perspective throughout an entire text. We might see multiple perspectives used to great effect to cast doubt on events or to give us information that particular characters do not have. All right, I hope that was helpful and enjoy the rest of the masterclass.